Hi everyone, I'm here today with a political book review, uh, this time of one that's a, sort of a political drama, but one entirely based on research into real events of the late 20th century United States Congress. The book is one that came out in mid-2020, and it's called Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party by Julian E. Zelzer. Now, I know that, of course, political books can be a bit dicey because everyone, including the author, will view them through their own politicized lens. So I'll just say that my political views are probably what you'd call center-left uh, by U.S. standards, but I'm going to try to be as generous as I can to both sides of the U.S. political spectrum while reviewing this book. Because this is a book that, in my opinion, is pretty fair to both sides. Yes, the author's attitudes are perhaps suggested by the very title, Burning Down the House, which suggests a critical attitude towards the political shifts in Congress that he describes within and attributes mainly to the Republican Party, or GOP. But I was impressed with how the author, for the most part, manages to tell a story that seems at least to me like it could appeal to fans of our protagonist Newt Gingrich, and more broadly of the Republican Party, uh, not just their critics. Well, to a point, I guess. To be fair, Gingrich is certainly cast as the unapologetic villain at times, especially later on in the book, to an extent that sometimes weakens the book's overall impact as merely a historical chronicle of a certain period in the history of Congress. More on that later, though, because I first need to say a bit more about what the book is actually about. So the book is a nonfiction political drama, and one that focuses pretty exclusively on the entire political process within the legislative branch of U.S. government, uh, specifically within the House of Representatives, one of the two chambers of Congress. While some specific political issues are mentioned in the book and explained briefly, the author is not focused here on exploring the right answers to these issues, nor the merits to either side's arguments. Uh, though the language that he uses to describe these issues, such as the characterization of the new Republican stance as limiting reproductive rights versus something more neutral like uh, opposing abortion, this language does allow the author's own stances to seep through on occasion. But for the most part, he focuses on these issues as part of the playing field in which Republicans and Democrats within the U.S. House of Representatives are vying for influence. The issues are what's at stake. There are ways for each side to score political points. And the discussion focuses on how the two sides battle within this political landscape to advance their own agendas. So while I found this book very interesting and very enjoyable to read, uh, it's not going to be for everyone. Don't read this book, for example, if you want to learn more about the history of the issues themselves that the government tried to tackle during this time period, because it's not what this book is. Uh, also, don't read it if you just want to know what happened. Uh, only read it if you're interested in seeing the whole process presented as a political drama. And while this drama is, in my opinion, quite useful for getting a glimpse into how the U.S. Congress works or has worked before, if this is all old news to you or this is not something you care about, you could really gather the main thesis of this book by just reading a summary article or a short interview with the author. But anyway, I enjoyed the book. Um, it follows two key characters in the U.S. House of Representatives, mainly during the late 1980s and early 1990s. One of those characters is uh, the Republican representative Newt Gingrich, who appears in the title and whom the author asserts was a decisive factor in changing the norms or the way business is done within the U.S. House of Representatives. The other is the Speaker of the House from 1987 to 1989, Texan Democrat Jim Wright, and he's the primary target of Gingrich's campaign to burn down the House. And this, by the way, would be figuratively, not literally, in case, uh, yeah, let's just say that. You see, the Republicans were becoming increasingly frustrated with their inability to really pass through the most conservative parts of their agenda. Sure, they had had a few Republican presidents recently, but one of those, Richard Nixon, had resigned a decade earlier in disgrace after the famous Watergate scandal, and even the beloved eight-year President Ronald Reagan had found himself somewhat limited in the end in what he was able to achieve. His presidency hadn't been quite the revolution to the extent that his conservative supporters had hoped for. Because in spite of controlling the presidency, the Republicans hadn't possessed a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives in over 30 years. So because of the U.S. government's system of checks and balances, the Democratic-controlled House was always able to push back at least a little bit against the president, and to argue with some substance to their claim that this represented the will of the people who had elected them, after all. So the Republicans, from the time Gingrich was elected in 1979, were really fighting tooth and nail to take back control of the House, and were becoming increasingly desperate. And Gingrich and others in his Republican Party saw an opportunity in the U.S. public's increased attention to ethics, corruption, and scandal within the U.S. government. 
You see, President Nixon's scandal and resignation, along with a few other recent scandals like the Abscam scandal in which some undercover agents disguised as influential Arab leaders had managed to bribe several Democratic members of Congress, these scandals had not just tarnished the Republicans' reputation, but had contributed to a growing perception among the U.S. public that the whole government, Congress included, was basically full of a bunch of crooks. Adding to this perception was the fact that, indeed, there were many examples of what could arguably be seen as corruption in the U.S. government. For example, even beyond the Abscam scandal, there were plenty of examples of company lobbyists who uh, contributed money to a representative's election campaign only to receive legislative favors in return, or what's called pork barrel spending, in which representatives smuggle language into other important bills that then funnel money back to their local jurisdictions and constituents, and maybe the person who put a lot of money in their pocket. But at least as Zelizer argues, what much of the U.S. public didn't realize was that for better or for worse, uh, this was kind of how government worked at the time, even if it seemed dysfunctional to our common sensibilities. Up until this point, it was not necessarily seen as a travesty, but rather an expectation that the representatives people chose would bring back money to support the districts that had chosen them. That's not to say that it's necessarily the way things should be, uh, but rather that Zelizer claims that this was less abnormal than the fairly naive public was really able to understand at the time. So the public knew just enough to make them dangerous. And Gingrich saw that this increased attention to ethics and corruption could work in his favor, because although as he knew well the ethics violations, both real and perceived, were not limited to the Democrats, but applied to the Republicans as well, including himself in some cases, uh, the Democrats were the ones in power, and therefore the onus was on them to actually do something about it. So the more that Gingrich and his allies could draw public attention to corruption in government, particularly within the Democratic Party, uh, particularly within the House of Representatives, the more heat the Democrats would take, uh, since after all, they'd been the top dogs in the House for quite some time now. And that's exactly what Gingrich did. Uh, so as he gained influence, he set his eyes on a prominent target, the Democratic Speaker of the House, Jim Wright. And as we see in this book, Jim Wright was indeed embroiled in some scandals. The author is never quite clear as to how much weight these scandals should have been given, which I think is totally reasonable because Zelzer's claim is that Jim Wright was neither free from guilt nor was he the epitome of corruption in government. But regardless of the extent of his guilt, he became a convenient focal point for the U.S. public's frustration with government corruption. So the bulk of this book really focuses on the ensuing battles between Gingrich and his Republican allies uh, as they fought for influence of Congress and as Wright and his Democratic allies uh, fought to hold on. And Gingrich's camp approached this not so much by rallying support for the party's platform of issues, as Zelizer claims was more of the way they used to do it throughout history, uh, but instead now by drawing the public's attention to the very game of politics itself. Uh, because it's hard to keep track of all the current issues and our positions on them, and who exactly supports these positions. But it's easy to infer that someone who cheats to advance their positions is probably not someone who we should agree with or should support anyway. And you can certainly see this sentiment even pervading today's news media too. For example, I read the New York Times and, and I like it. It's a good publication for what it is. But this reminded me of a little quiz they had on their website at the end of 2021. It was called the Year in Politics Quiz. I thought that going through would be a fun and interesting way to catch up on some of the political discussions uh, and debates that I'd missed during the year, but no, it was not that at all. It was all about who said what nasty thing about whom, who was caught in what scandal, uh, you can pretty much imagine it. Not informative at all about the issues of the day, but probably got a lot more clicks and shares than it would have if it had contained more substance. So I'm going to leave the summarizing there because if you know your recent U.S. political history, or even maybe if you just read the subtitle of the book, you already know how things turned out, though I'd venture to say that many of us, like myself, didn't really know this all before reading. Uh, but you'll have to read the book, or at least a summary of the book, if you want to learn just how it went down, procedurally speaking. Okay, so what assertion is the author, Zelizer, making about the political system in this book? He's arguing that the mode of operation of Congress was irrevocably changed in the 1980s by this shift in the Republicans' focus from solid issues to instead attacking corruption and scandals in their opponents what you might call mudslinging rather than substantial debate. He argues that Newt Gingrich was instrumental in bringing about this sea change and the new Republican Party, as he calls it, and he further claims that this transformation was not inevitable and could have been avoided under different leadership. Zelizer's assessment blames the Republicans for this shift in the U.S. political landscape, but he doesn't completely absolve the Democrats from guilt either, since as even he portrays them, they were kind of becoming complacent in their control of the House in a way that made them less responsive to concerns of corruption, both real and imagined. 
And based on one interview I saw with the author by Politics and Prose, I suspect that the book was actually more one-sided in the author's original conception, but that his editor convinced him to further explore the merits in these accusations of rights corruption, uh, just to make it feel like more of a genuine and relatable story, uh, and less of simply a political smear against Gingrich. I'd argue that he didn't always go quite far enough with these changes, but to the extent that he did change it to make it more balanced, it made the book more effective. If your views are pretty extremely Republican, you might still find the tone of this book too critical. On the other hand, if you're a devout Democrat, you might also find the tone of this book not critical enough. Both of these are sentiments that I saw in some of the Goodreads reviews that I skimmed. You see, depending on how you view it all, you can read this book and view Newt Gingrich as either a villain or as a sort of anti-hero. How you interpret Gingrich's disruptive actions in the House, his deviations from the House's established conventions, his selective manipulation of the truth to gain political influence, this all could very well depend on whether you support the goals that he was trying to achieve by it. Of course, that's just part of the picture. As Zelizer tells it, the gap between the old Republicans and the new Republicans is that the latter were willing to flout the standard conventions in order to push their political agenda, seeing that previous efforts had continually failed, whereas the old guard, those who didn't shift their attitudes by the end of the book at least, were reluctant to progress to an era of stronger partisanship. In some ways, it's a question of whether the ends justify the means, and I guess it's also a bit of a question of whether the means Gingrich and his allies used were low-handed and dirty, or if they were just politics, maybe just a natural progression of some of the same tactics even that the Democrats themselves had used at times. And these questions are really interesting to me because when you read about congressional dynamics nowadays, especially if you read some of the portrayals from both sides of the aisle, we see these same sorts of arguments occurring again and again. And for a memorable example, take Democratic President Barack Obama's 2016 nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. As a reminder, if you don't remember this event, one of the justices on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Scalia, died towards the end of Obama's term. As the rules of government dictate, Obama was free to nominate a new justice to the Supreme Court, which he did. He picked the liberal-leaning justice Merrick Garland, but as the rules also dictate, the U.S. Senate had the duty to vote to confirm Garland, in other words, to give him the final approval. But the last thing that the Republican-controlled Senate wanted was a left-leaning justice uh, appointed by a Democratic president, particularly because Supreme Court justices serve lifelong terms. So, led by then-Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, they punted on the decision and said, you know what, we're not going to have this vote yet for confirmation. Let's wait a few months, because there's an election coming up, and then this can be an issue for the voters to decide on. Do they want Merrick Garland, a judge appointed by the current Democratic president? Or do they instead want a Republican president, that would be Donald Trump, to appoint a more conservative-leaning judge? Which was a risk on their part, but it's exactly what happened, as the voters did choose Republican president Donald Trump, who then instead appointed Justice Neil Gorsuch, who was then confirmed by the still Republican-controlled Senate. But anyway, my point here is, how do we interpret this event? If it was really important to you to get a conservative justice on the Supreme Court, or even if you just generally support the Republicans' agenda, you probably think this was excellent politics. Sure, it wasn't really a move that had been made before, but it was technically within the rules of the legislature and government. If, on the other hand, you're a big supporter of the Democrats, you probably view this as the shadiest, most underhanded strategy for obstructing the normal nomination process and totally contrary to the spirit of the law, even if it follows the rules, and yeah, you're probably even madder that then four years later in 2020, at the end of President Trump's term, they pushed through one final Supreme Court nominee of Trump's three total, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, but as a Republican supporter would probably point out, there was a key difference here, which was that in 2020, the Republicans, at least for a bit longer, controlled both the presidency and the Senate. So of course they were going to do this because, again, it's technically within the rules. I realize, by the way, that this example refers to the Senate rather than the U.S. House of Representatives, which was the focus of this book, uh, but I suspect that the norms of the two are closely connected, even if not exactly the same. Basically, in a totally nonpartisan sense, your view on these events should probably come down to a question of whether you think there are certain unwritten norms that should dictate the way that the U.S. Congress operates. Should certain partisan moves, like obstructing a judicial nominee or using the filibuster, which is basically a way to stall discussion on a bill, should these and even other sneakier tactics be allowed, uh, assuming they follow the letter of the law? Or is the end consequence of these actions, the partisanship it engenders, and the disruption of the smooth legislative process, is that negative enough that it should once again be reformed? I really don't know, but this is a big question in U.S. politics that I don't expect will be going away anytime soon. 
and unfortunately most of the public discussions I see about these topics don't really seem sincere in finding a more effective solution or getting to the bottom of this fundamental question. They simply seem focused on reframing the discussion in a way that's advantageous to whatever party they support, which unfortunately is to some extent necessary when that is what the other side is doing, but I feel like there needs to be more acknowledgement that this is what's happening at least, and that the answers to these questions aren't quite as common sense as either party would have us believe. But maybe this book can form one component of a more nuanced overall discussion, even if this book also has its own leanings. The one big question that stuck with me after reading this book though is, to what extent did the way business is done in Congress really change during Gingrich's tenure during the 1980s and 1990s? I mean, if you look at the history books, there are certainly instances much earlier in time when the rules of Congress were used to a partisan advantage. I mean, the filibuster, which if you're not familiar with it, it basically means getting up in front of the Senate and just talking, 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 talking more to stall indefinitely so that there's no time to actually vote on a proposed law or get anything else done for that matter. That's like a prime example of a procedural loophole that for example, the Southern Democrats in the 1950s and 60s used to oppose civil rights legislation. Uh, maybe some of the difference is that these are political tools that uh, used to be deployed much more sparingly, whereas nowadays the partisanship is strong enough that either party will stop pretty much anything the other party suggests, uh, even things that are, are recognized by both sides to be a good idea. I believe that Zelizer's assessment of this shift in congressional norms is probably largely accurate, but I think he could have brought this point home a bit stronger with some more concrete evidence uh, comparing before and after, because skeptics will likely need more information to be fully convinced of the story Zelizer's telling here. Uh, similarly, I find Zelizer's claim that things could have gone a different way if not for Gingrich uh, somewhat dubious. I mean, yeah, we never really can know how things might have gone, but Zelizer highlights in this book plenty of pre-existing factors that paved the ground for this shift in the inner workings of Congress, like a nascent focus on political scandals and attention from new political watchdog organizations and the emergence of conservative talk radio as an alternative to the news media that the right increasingly saw as dominated by liberal-leaning views. Add to that a resentment within the Republican Party at being a minority for 30 years in the House of Representatives and a complacency within the Democratic majority, an unwillingness to take reform and anti-corruption interests seriously, whether or not these accusations were politically motivated or not. I guess my naive assessment of this all is that if things were going to head in a different direction for Congress and for modern political discourse, it probably would have had to take a lot more than simply Gingrich not being elected to Congress. That is, although I think that Gingrich did become a decisive actor in this play, I still think he was merely filling a role that was already open and just approaching it with his own flair. If not for Gingrich, I think someone else would have simply stepped in and filled the same role. So all said and done, I enjoyed this book, although I think it had even more potential than it achieved. I think that sometimes the author's own political views came through in a way that, regardless of whether you agree with them, weakens the narrative just a bit. Uh, and I say this as someone who probably mostly agrees with him on the issues themselves. And I also think that he makes some claims about the course of politics in the House of Representatives that, while plausible, aren't exactly conclusive based on the information he gives. In the end, it's a story more than it's an argument. But that said, if you're someone who enjoys a good political story, and one that actually happened at that, you might find this book interesting, as long as you're willing to just read it with an ounce of healthy skepticism. So that's my first political book review of the year. Uh, I have at least one other political book to discuss, which will be Anne Applebaum's Twilight of Democracy, so stay tuned for that one if you're interested. And until next time, bye and happy reading.